This episode of the BJJ Foxcast is brought to you by BioPro. BioPro is an all-natural alternative to prescription human growth hormone, which aids in recovery, anti-aging, metabolism, libido, immunity, skin health, cognition, sleep, and stress. Just one vial per day provides a substantial boost to all of these growth factors. Okay, so that's what they want me to say. Here's what I know as an aging grappler. I've been using BioPro Plus and the nighttime variant BioPro Plus Cortisleep for several months, and it feels like I've grown a third lung. My, ga- my gas tank is noticeably bigger. My recovery is faster, and I'm back on the mats much quicker, not just between training sessions, but between rounds. Now you can get $30 off your first order of BioPro when you use the code FOXCAST at www.bioproteintech.com. That's code FOXCAST. For $30 off your first order at www.bioproteintech.com. Thank you, BioPro. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the BJJ FoxCast. I am your host, Alex Martinez, and today I am honored to have my friend Danny Allen on the show, DJ Danny Allen, and again, the goon, my man, Colin Opper's on the show. Welcome, boys. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so um, we just got done with probably, I don't know, man, top three open mats I've ever been to. It was awesome today. There was a lot of people there. There were <laughs> so many people. Yeah. A lot of killers. Yeah, man. Yeah. And, I, you know, most of the time when, when people say, oh, it's a couple hour open mat and then a couple hour like social, most people comply. <laughs> they didn't today. People were rolling for four hours. Yeah. It was wild, dude. People were rolling all the way until I was like picking up my stuff and starting to turn the audio off. And so I thought it was really great. Yeah. That just the, the community came together so well, you know, because a, a bunch of the guys that were rolling at the end weren't from, you know, our normal gems. I yeah. Well, there was one dude from Japan. Yeah. That was there. I don't know, right. like, I didn't get a chance to talk to him very much, but did I? he was uh, visiting, I don't know, I don't know what yeah. he was doing here, but it was kind of cool, you know, ended up at our open mat. Um, I got some, I got some pretty good roles, I got some pretty awful roles, you know, <laughs> on, on my part, but it was, overall it was good, man, and then you uh, closed out the show with uh, with your uh, DJ, yes. yeah, with the music, so that was cool, man. How long have you been doing that? So I've been DJing roughly since 98. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay. we, um... <clears throat> It was, uh, I just, I was going to a lot of raves, a lot of clubs, things like that. And I, um, I saw this one guy named DJ Prophet one day and he was like, uh, my first friend, you know, so I went to the club and I'm all, I know that guy, I know that guy. <laughs> and, um, he was doing like a surprise set. And so he came on and he gave me a big high five and I felt like the coolest kid in the whole school. Yeah. And, um, how old were you? Oh, what was it? I was 90, 98. So I was like 22. Oh, okay. Okay. There, if my yeah. math is correct. Yeah. Um, and I remember that moment he um, was, he put his hand out and he was doing this and as he was like controlling the crowd. I'm like, you know, I wasn't sober. So whatever. Um, <laughs> I'm sitting there and I was like, whoa, but I looked at him and I remember looking behind me and see the silhouette as he was speeding up the record and the, the crowd was dancing faster. And I was like, whoa. And that was the moment I knew I wanted to do it. Wow. Okay. It's like, okay. It was powerful. Wow. Have you, have you done any like raves yourself? Oh yeah. Yeah. We, I threw shows for shoot 15 years. Okay. Okay, how, how does how does one get into that? Because I mean, all I see is like clips on the internet where it's like gigantic. You know, I'm sure it doesn't start that way. No, I don't. It's so when I was 15, my sister took me to one. Um, it's it was the Recycler Rave at 16th and Harrison, and um, it was both of our birthdays. Our birthdays are about a day apart. And so she took me and she's like, you got to check this out. And I remember um, I didn't fit in quite, you know, but nobody really cared. I'm wearing like no fear stuff and everybody's got like cool hippie stuff on. And yeah, and it just was it was hilarious. But I just remember everybody was so nice to me and I didn't even know there was a DJ the first night. I'm not going to lie. I did not know there was a DJ. I thought that I didn't know. I just didn't yeah. even think about it. I was walking around with my buddy and we're dancing. I'm like, wow, where are they coming from? But uh, it was, it was just amazing. I, I went to this little rave in San Francisco and then I kept going with my sister cause she was the cool person at the time. Right. Yeah. And um, it just turned into, I wanted to go more and more and more. And then finally I was like, you know, I want to DJ. And then eventually, you know, met the right people and, in the DJ, we met the promoters, this, that, the other, and started throwing shows. Wow. Just chain reaction from there. Were you still doing vinyl? Like, were you doing vinyl back in the in the beginning? Absolutely. That's I have a, I have probably 300 records underneath my bed. Wow. You know, Evie stubs her toe on them all the time. So <laughs> it's, it's hilarious. Uh, it's hilarious, man. Yeah. So <clears throat> what's the biggest difference between, like, back then and now? Like, is it is it easier to DJ these days, or is it harder thanks to technology? What has that done? <clears throat> It's a, it's a, it's a multi-parted answer, I would suppose. Um, as far as like skill wise, you don't need a lot of skill anymore. Mm. Uh, the computer does it all for you, mm. um, snaps everything. Um, 
you know, but the other side of that is there's so many uh, safety nets there and you can actually utilize a lot of the effects and processors there and samplers and things like that, which, you know, I see some of the other guys, you know, just hitting buttons, you know, they got the samples ready and that's really cool. It's just a different style, but well, there's, there's preparation that goes into that of too. Of course. I mean, yeah. it's tons of preparation. Like even for this little set I did for Paul today, you know, I was working for about two weeks, you know, to make sure I had the right songs. Yeah. But it's, uh, I would say, I mean, a lot of DJs who listen to this are going to laugh, but if I throw um, a set of turntables with records in front of a DJ nowadays, they won't know what to do. And yeah. that's fine, you know, but that's where I grew up from. And I feel like I can grab any kind of platform. And within a couple of minutes, I know what I'm doing. Because okay. it's all the same wow. for the most part. Okay. So it's it's a little easier now. It's really saturated, the market, of course. But, you know, I, I was taught by DJ Morgan back in the days, like, do something to set yourself apart. You know, do something that makes those kids that are all messed up or whatever go, man, that was a great show, man. The music was great, but that one guy with the, with the nail polish or whatever, or the bright hair, you know, cause I used to do a bunch of that kind of stuff, set yeah. myself apart, mm -hmm. you know, it was a uh, just different industry, I suppose. So yeah, just different. Who's the biggest, uh, who, who would you say is like the biggest guy out there? Who's the biggest, well, most well-known DJ out there? The most well-known DJ was, um, it's, it's interesting. I would categorize that in two, two section, separate sections. So there's the DJs like, um, like what, uh, Skrillex, those kind of guys that, you know, most of the mainstream know. Mm -hmm. And I would say that guy's amazing. He's big. He came from, you know, nothing. Um, and that would probably be the one I would think of, but for me, I would think to go back to some UK DJs that most people don't know about, mm. uh, like Dom Sweeten from Defective Audio, uh, Paul Glasby from Vicious Circle. Those guys really uh, are the ones that, you know, and of course, everybody listening to this is like, who's that? But you look up Paul Glasby and, and Dom Sweeten, uh, they have just been making the music for about 25 years, and it is absolutely stellar. Mm. Um, so it's, I don't know, it, it's, it's changed so much, but I feel like, those guys really hold it up as opposed to they do the raves and the clubs and what I feel is a real um, vibe of electronic music as opposed to the festivals where like Skrillex and those guys go. Those guys uh, do those festivals. The vibe's not the same. Mm. I don't feel like I go there to a party. I feel like it's a carnival. I don't oh, feel I a vibe. Yeah. I, you know, I, I personally like the Dirty Dark Warehouse. It's three in the morning <laughs> when I'm playing. I'm playing the best banging music. But that one guy that walks up to me, and says, you know, whether I can even understand what he's saying because it's so loud, but he just looks at me and we have this connection. Yeah. And he's just like, dude. And I know he's not there, probably not there for the girls. He's probably not even there for the favors. He's probably there to just beat his feet and dance at three in the morning and just get taken away. Yeah. And those are the shows that I personally prefer. That's cool. So. That's cool. Where did the whole rave thing start? Frankie Bones. Frankie Bones was actually uh, this gentleman making um, techno and electronic music back in the day, right? And he would take all these different genres and styles and, and he was like making stuff and he was just creating things, you know, and not knowing. He started doing these raves called NASA raves. You guys can look them up and they're the first raves out in New York. So what he did was he started throwing these parties, didn't even call them raves. They were just electronic music parties. Then these guys from the UK were like, hey, we really like that. And they're like, we're going to pay you to come over here to the UK and play. And he's like, yeah, right. Whatever. <laughs> so they did. And he did a tour and he blew up all over the UK. And when he came back to the United States, he's like, let's do what they were doing. Yeah. And they were raves. So long story short, um, actually one of the biggest accomplishments I had is we paid to have Frankie Bones play a show. And I was on the very bottom of the flyer with the Godfather raves at the very top. It was huge. And he wow. was amazing. I can't tell you everything we provided him, but you know. <laughs> did you get a chance to sit and talk with him? I did. He was an amazing man, but he, I'll just say this. He wasn't sober and he's like, we got, you got a hotel room for me. That's fine. I want to get back on the plane and go back to New York. Yeah. He was, he was ready to go. Yeah. So wow, man. He was so, awesome. yeah, I mean, I'm assuming, assuming if you're in the music industry, you have a love for music. Where, where did that start for you? I would say mostly my parents, I suppose my parents, my mom and my dad always listen to pretty good music, but well-versed. Um, Elvis, you know, seventies, this, that, the other, but, mm. um, I guess my biggest musical influence was probably my sister for taking me to Primus shows and Mr. Bungle shows. And I was like 14 years old. Um, we would go to tool shows and she just really hammered, didn't even like try to, she just wanted to include me. And I think there was a point where it actually switched over where she's like, so what are you listening to? And so, oh, no shit. Yeah. yeah it it really cool. did switch over. So. Um, I'd say my sister is probably the biggest musical influence. Wow. 
Cool, man. And, and does she does she do music as well? Does nope. she? No, she doesn't. No <laughs> shit. No, okay. she's about to be a lawyer. She's taking the bar very soon. Oh, very cool. Well, good luck to her. Yeah, That's awesome. Well. That's awesome. And I, I'm I'm assuming you've been to a few a few raves. I've been to a couple. I was just gonna ask: Have you ever <laughs> been to one where you have to like? Go to a, it's like a back of a convenience store. You have to show the absolutely <laughs> show the the cashier an egg. What? And then they'll let you in the back. What? So back in the day, they would do these things, and we tried to actually bring <laughs> it back. But um, so in San Francisco, we'd have like uh, map points because you know, of course, all the the cops and stuff they'd want to bust your party. You know, a lot of it was illegal. So you know, hypothetically, we'd be like, okay, Colin, you're going to be at the AM PM. These people are going to come. You give them the little piece of paper, and then they're going to go to either the next spot or go to the party or go to the next spot where they get picked up by the shuttle. And oh, so that's no what shit. he's talking about. Very we would cloak always, and dagger. yeah, it was yeah. very cool back in the day. Wow. Sometimes What's it like now? Is, is, is it all coordinated and sell tickets and shit now? Yeah. Yeah. Get it all I would up. say one of the, one of the, it's so different. Uh, uh, Fat Boy Slim. Yeah. I, I went to one of his shows and it's, it's, not, it, I know what you're saying where it doesn't feel like a rave, mm-hmm. but it doesn't also, it doesn't feel like a concert. Okay. It just, it's, <clears throat> it seems like he's always making eye contact and, and, and he's, and, and you're feeding, it's, you're feeding off the crowd. Wow. And, okay. And so he might, you know, if you go to a band, they might print out this is this is what we're gonna play for the a set first list. set. Yeah, this is gonna be the second set, and this yeah. is what we're gonna do for encore. Yeah. That might change after the third song. Just exactly. How, how Absolutely. The, how the crowd is reacting. That's kind of my favorite thing at concerts when like a band that's been around forever, you know, maybe they don't rehearse as much as they used to. They mm-hmm. get together and they play these shows and the crowd will start getting so into it and they'll just start yelling songs that they want to hear and you see the band kind of gather in the center of the stage you're like oh fuck it let's we haven't done this one in years but we're just gonna have you ever seen those those oh, yeah. fantastic we we, we 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 saw a show in mexico where the band was picking like songs out of a hat like out of, they had like 10 albums or something so they're just picking songs out of a hat they're like oh shit i don't think i know this one they just play it and it was, that was that was pretty cool so I, I enjoy that kind of stuff i mean it makes it more personal kind of thing right Oh yeah, and there's a, a musician that I really like. His name is Bob Schneider. He tours. He does like a, a West Coast tour. He does an East Coast tour. But ninety percent of his shows are just in one bar in Austin, Texas. Okay. But he'll play every day, and you'll never hear the same set twice. Wow, amazing! And then he has just a group of friends where they uh, they 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 show it online and they'll come up with a topic and they have to write a song and they write a song in like five minutes. Wow, it's it's. It's just amazing. Like the musical talent is just, yeah, yeah. I, I have none of that. I don't either. <laughs> I don't either. I mean, there was, um, there was a thing on, um, well that she's, she seems to be talked about so much now. It's uh, Taylor Swift talking about w- the way she writes a song is like, she'll get a thing in her head and she'll just write it down and she'll get so many things. It kind of goes into this box. Right. And she just start looking through and be like eh, box by box. I mean, mostly on her phone. Right. And, She's like, she'll just start piecing these things together and like, well, this could be a song. You know what I mean? And she'll listen. She'll, she'll think of something or hear something. Oh, that could be a hook. And she'll make a note, stuff like that. Do you, do you do anything like that for your stuff? There's a program that I I used to use where, um, I I used to work in tandem with another DJ. Him and I had equal parts where I was kind of the guy in the chair and I was like, make it sound like this. And he would click it away. And, you know, he was really great at that. He was amazing. Um, so I would actually get at this one program because I would be sitting there, you know, doing business or whatever, you know, um, just kind of thing like that. And I would start humming away, you know, I'd dun, 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 dun. And then I'd start changing it in my head. And I feel like a lot of us have those kinds of in, uh, influences or, or excuse me, sometimes those in, uh, inspirations when we're doing business, playing on our phone, um, sitting, waiting for traffic. But, you know, I mean, the most simple songs are so simple or the most amazing songs are so simple. Yeah. I mean, you just, you get that, that hook in your head and you're like, dur, 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 whatever it is. So I try to use that uh, program and that program really will just record my voice and it'll, you know, it'll key it up and that kind of thing. So that's a really cool tool that I used to use when I produced, when I produced, um, and I would take inspiration off of anything, a movie. I love that. Yeah. But, you know, just pieces here, pieces there. You'd be surprised where the inspiration comes from for writing. Yeah. Now does your DJ style change based on like shit going on in your life? Like, are you like maybe a little more aggressive at times and you know, and you're more melancholy in other, other times? Absolutely. There's, there's, um, I would, uh, it's almost like in sub genres. If you will, um, you know, I play like trance music and house music when it's everything's kind of chill because that's a really chill vibe for me. 
Um, everything's at about 130 beats per minute, 140 beats per minute tops. Um, especially with the trance, it's very melodic and pretty, very dreamy almost in the stuff that I choose. But when I'm uh, pumped, um, aggravated, aggressive, you know, I like to play um, UK hard house, uh, UK hardcore um, stuff that's just pounding and banging. Um, sometimes it's happy hardcore. Sometimes it's just nasty, evil stuff. But it definitely changes. And as I've gotten older, my genre tastes have changed as well. Yeah. You know, I like to have my hair on fire at 180 beats per minute with some hardcore. But now, you know, I'm pretty happy listening to like easy listening sometimes, <laughs> and not even techno. It's funny. But, yeah. You know, it's all an influence. It's. I think it's a big circle. Mm. And it really just comes all together. And now I'm using influences from more mellow music and the stuff that I choose. Okay. And, and who, who out there, is there, is there like a certain band or is there a certain DJ out there that kind of is like been a, a big influence on you to like to this day? I mean, you mentioned a couple in the beginning, mm -hmm. but like along the way you find other, like, I, I like to call them like digital mentors, right? You find them online, stuff like that. Anything, anything like that? Um, I mean, there's so many out there that. I would probably say my most, the biggest influence that I have, and this will probably, you'll love this, is ministry. Al right. Jorgensen and ministry. Um, back in back in the 80s, the early 80s, a lot of people are unaware, but Al Jorgensen and ministry played um, more of a like Depeche Mode mm -hmm. kind of theme yeah. songs, you know, uh, um, you know, Every Day is Good for Halloween, whatever the title is. But um, as he evolved, the evolution of his music got harder and harder and harder. And what I really held on to was how he melded the genres and how he used percussionist and two guitarists and a couple of bassists and, you know, just different things to um, execute the same plan. Mm. And I thought it was beautiful what he did. I finally got to meet him one day and and that was cool. I was all fanboying out. I dropped my phone, all that <laughs> stuff. But um, he just, uh, you know, even nowadays, like you remember like what, 90s ish ministry is going pretty hard. Yeah. And now they're coming back to like more like almost melodic metal, if you will. And I'm wow. like, yeah, I like that. It's chill. Because you know? <laughs> it's funny, the, uh, ministry, I was at a, uh, ministry show right after Brad Noel from Sublime passed away, and they played three Sublime songs. And See, you're just like, this, I'm not supposed to hear, but, and it, and it, it worked. It, they're so good. They're so, they're talented and, and amazing. And, and just a, appreciation for music in general. Of course. Yeah. I mean, those guys, that, <clears throat> I would say ministry is probably one of the biggest influences. I love Tool, of course. I, I think Tool, the way that Tool does things and how succinct and perfect they are and how you take your time to execute something absolutely flawlessly, it kind of is my philosophy in jiu-jitsu as well. Yeah. You know, here we go back to full circle again. Yeah. yeah. And Maynard is a, is he a black belt now? He's a brown uh, belt. Brown belt. Brown belt? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, he's got a, uh, what is it, Verde Valley BJJ or something like that. Mm -hmm. his place. Yeah, really cool, man. Um. So let, yeah, let's talk. Let's talk jujitsu. When when did you find jujitsu? Like, how did that come into your life? Um, like a lot of people, probably the same as you. We were watching UFC one, two, and three. <laughs> so <laughs> we're watching one UFC one, two, and three, and I saw this tiny little skinny guy, Hoist Gracie, with a gi on, choke the crap out of everybody and beat everybody. And I was like, "What? You be kidding me?" Watch number two, and he did it again. I think the third one he got hurt or something, right? Yeah, he couldn't. He couldn't continue. But yeah. then he won four, I believe. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he won number four. And it just it it, <clears throat> boom! It hit me in the face. It's like, whoa, you know. And with all the the BS I've had to deal with throughout life, it was, you know, that was something I always wanted to do. But I didn't do it. I mm. didn't do it until ninety. What? Or and I didn't do it till thirteen years ago. Wow. Okay. But I wanted to. Yeah. Yeah. And and what made you take that first step? Well, getting older, I. Um, did an actual bucket list. I, I was like, Hey, let's do a bucket list. Okay. And the first thing on there was do jujitsu. And so I called a couple of places and they were kind of assholes to me, but whatever. And then, um, I actually, um, texted or Nick Diaz before he was like super, super famous. Yeah. I texted him cause he friended me on his uh, Facebook account <clears throat> before it got all shut down. Mm. And, um, I kept bugging him. I'm like, where should I go? Cause I saw him one day and he's like, you don't have to just do like MMA. You can do jujitsu. And I'm like, yeah, cause MMA looks like a lot. Yeah. And then I was like, huh, but I never forgot what Nick said, not Nate, but Nick. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, okay. So I called around, I called around and, you know, and his publicist, I think, cause they messaged me back and gave me a couple recommendations. And then the only people that were nice to me were Paragon. I went there one day, did a class, threw my money down, said, I'm here. And that was it. <laughs> one day. Wait, which, where, Paragon where? Paragon in San Luis Obispo. Oh, okay. Okay. Wow. And what, that was 13 years ago? Yeah. No shit. 
it was a big gap between me just being a dirt bag and a this, that, and the other. <laughs> and finally woke up. I'm like, I don't want to be a dirt bag anymore. And you yeah. know, I want to do stuff. Wow. And what was your first experience like with the Paragon guys? What, um, what made you throw your money down and say, let's do this? Well, um, they were, uh, I, I think, I think the day I went in there was a Saturday. So, you know, as we all know, we get a lot of looky loos that come in there and they're like, we're going to do it. And, oh, we'll be back and stuff. So I think that they were maybe a little tired that day or whatnot. I don't think they would, they didn't think I was going to sign up or maybe they didn't think I was serious, but, uh, the class was great. I remember we went over an up and over sweep and, um, I think a scissor sweep as well. Um, I still suck at both of those, honestly. <laughs> and, um, I just remember like I tried rolling. I remember the first person I rolled with was shoot Bavina, And then I rolled with, um, with the T 2000. I, I forget his name right now, but he was one of the champions of Paragon. He was a black belt and, and oh, wow. um, yeah. he's like, uh, well, what do I do? He's all, you need to go watch YouTube. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> Shit. <laughs> yeah. Wild man. Yeah. And how long were you with Paragon? Seven and a half years, wow. something like that. Okay. I think and I, that's before you moved here then. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. I was with um, Chris Lovato and then we would just get the car, everybody get in the, get on the weekends and we'd just go all the way down to Santa Barbara, go visit friend Gina and Jeff Glover and Bill Cooper. And we had Paragons all up and down the coast. So we seriously would just go and travel the coast and hit a different one and go yeah. to the beach. Did you run into Milton Bastos while you were? Milton was my very first private lesson ever no kidding yes wow love the picture somewhere but that's cool he was so nice like i guess they took <clears throat> this annual vacation or whatever and milton came in and i didn't know who he was and i was like um I, I want a private lesson i think and they're like he's all okay and i'm like but i only have 60 dollars." he's all it's okay i'm all oh that's cool yeah. man he was yeah. so nice yeah and taught me something that day that i still teach to this very day yeah what's that um so the way that i would get a cross collar he always talked about the contour of somebody's hand and you know you don't necessarily have to shove your hand up in there and just grab right but what if you like shove your hand up there and contour your hand around so you're thusly grabbing around their neck a wee bit more mm -hmm. and then when you actually do wrench down man you're really cranking on that carotid artery nice you know so that was i mean there's a couple lessons in that that yeah. private but that was the biggest one yeah he so. won a world championship i think in nogi with, mm -hmm. with paragon mm -hmm. yeah that's cool I yeah. remember that. Yeah, it was wild, man. Because uh, I think Jeff Glover was like one of the biggest reasons he came and stayed in the United States, I believe. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And you got to train with both of them. I did. I got to train with both of them a lot. Um, Jeff more than Milton because Milton would travel a lot. And yeah. then um, Jeff was in and out, you know, doing things. Him and Bill Cooper were trying to start some stuff here and there and start up a gym. And they did. And it was cool. We'd go and support them. Um, those guys, I just learned so much from Jeff and Bill. I can't even say enough thanks to those guys. You know, they probably don't even remember me mostly, especially Bill. You know, he was only there for a while, but the lessons those guys taught, I still, every day, just like Milton. Yeah. Every day. Isn't that wild? Like, people, like, well, Milton was teaching in the Bay Area mm -hmm. for a while, so he had he had Saratoga, his own school. I think, right? Yeah. Yeah, he had his own school, and he, and he, a lot of the people that he taught were, like, you know, engineers from, you know, Silicon Valley, stuff like that, and he brought Jeff in to do either teach a class or maybe do a seminar. And these people are like questioning like Jeff, like, well, can't they just do this? <laughs> can't they just do that? And I, I think Milton was coming out of his skin because, and Jeff was cool about it. You know, he was cool about, it. but I guess, um, you know, thinking about it, that's kind of their environment where they challenge ideas all the time. That's what makes them great mm -hmm. engineers, right? That's kind of an exchange. It's an exchange of ideas until they come up with the best one or at least the whatever bosses think is the best one exactly but that's that's kind of the so i i don't i don't necessarily dis but it's jeff glover i don't that's disagree but it's jeff glover you got to keep your mouth shut but yeah but that's really i mean that's really the old school thinking right just keep your mouth shut and just listen that's what i was taught yeah same it yeah. really is you know because what they say is you know we'll figure it out right you know keep your mouth shut and if you're quiet long enough then you'll see why i'm talking about this yeah yeah yeah, there's a lot of that. And and I was also taught when, you know, you're, yes, you can help your training partner, but as soon as the instructor walks up, that's it. You just shut up and you just let them take over. So it's a, it's a very different environment than what we're in today. Very old school. Yeah. yeah. They, they were, I mean, you came up in the old school too. I mean, it's just I just remember too, we were uh, tournaments. Mm. Like if, if you were matched up with, you know, if you go into the semifinal and you're going to get someone to school, it was purely on seniority. Right. Like you had to bow out mm -hmm. if you were going up someone that was ranked higher than you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we still do that. I mean, 
you kind of you kind of bow out and then you settle it in the academy, you know, behind closed doors. Um, but it was I, I've I've done it I've done it a couple times, but it's never like it was never a seniority thing. We just kind of flipped a coin. I think that's more nowadays. It's 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 like you, let's rock paper scissors, yeah. like right in the middle. Yeah. Or or flip a coin, but you know, starting at at, at Henry's, it was that guy's been here longer than you. Yep. He outranks you. Yeah. Good job getting into the semifinals, but <laughs> you're done. <laughs> you're he's, done. He's, he's going on. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> that's I I kind of like that. You know, I don't mind bowing out to somebody who's been doing it longer than me. No big deal. I actually agree with that as well. Um, I think just that seniority. Um, I feel it just as being a black belt. You know, of course, you know, if they're our, our friends, you know, thank you, coach, that kind of thing. But, you know, I even spoke with Tojo the other day and I, we were just joking around. I'm like, you know, who am I going to fight you? You know, I'm not going to pay to fight you. I fight you every day. <laughs> and, um, yeah. I'm like, but if it does happen, you know, I looked at him and I said, I won't fight you. I'm not going to fight you in front of people like that. And that's just how I feel. He may be like, ah, screw it. But yeah. I won't fight my friend Tojo. I love that guy. And I won't fight him in front of people for, yeah. unless Paul tells us to. And then I will. But yeah, I'll fight him. <laughs> but I don't have that <laughs> right same, now. I don't have that same fire. I, just, I feel like I don't have that yeah. same fire. Maybe with him. Yeah, but. maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that's something else I want to talk to you about. We we um, we we've been on the same super fight, super fight card a couple times. And there's been times when I mean, you're like, what, 140? On yeah. a good day? 145. Okay, 145. And I've seen you fight guys that are not 145. Yeah. So tell barely. me about that. Like, I mean, th- I mean, obviously you have a relationship with Seth. And do you just tell him, like, hey, I'll fight anybody? Uh, yeah, I mean, I felt like... Because bad call. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah, yeah, there was... Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I do have that mentality. I will fight anybody. And I have gone into some fights known. I was... I'm just, you know, the whole thing was like, hey, don't get smoked. Don't get smoked <laughs> in front of the whole world, you know, yeah. but it's happened a couple of times. I have gotten smoked in front of the whole world and, but I still will just probably fight anybody because I just like to do it. Yeah. I like to prove to myself because you asked me 15 years ago, if I would have been fighting on pay-per-view in front of the world, you know, I would have giggled and been like, Oh, that's cool. Yeah. But yeah. you know, I, I, I know it's even Carlos has stated that to me. He's like, you said you'd fight this guy, but. Just protect yourself. And I'm like, yeah. well, I know what he's saying there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Yeah, and, and that was your next step, right? When you came to the States, there there was, I don't know that there was a Paragon school in, in Phoenix. I know there's one in Tucson. Yeah, there was one in Tucson. Yeah. Or there's, no, there's two in Tucson. Um, I think they used to have three, but one shut down. But yeah, we went and visited them. And Manny and uh, Manny and those guys at um, Irie and then, you know, Daimyo, those guys yep. are amazing. They are just, they were so nice to me when I was really in the turmoil of what to do. Yeah. I was in Arizona. I had, you know, kind of hit the realization that, oh shit, this isn't like two months. I'm staying, and they mentored me through it. You know, on what, what brought you do. here? Um, horrible, don't say a girl. Don't say a girl. Horrible relationship. Okay, that I right. got fair that enough. I was, um, I was a, I was a big enough adult, or I guess mature enough to realize that it was time to go. Okay. Okay. So cool, man. Yeah. So, so you get here and, and were you, were you kind of deciding whether you want to be in Tucson or Phoenix at that time? Is that why you visited there? No, I, I just, um, actually what happened was, uh, I moved in with Carrie, you know, the girl over there and Hi, uh, Carrie, <laughs> Carrie's my best friend. And so she saw that, you know, I was in kind of a need of a place and, you know, I had left the bad situation, you know, for good reason. And, you know, sometimes you just leave a situation and you figure it out. Right. Well, Carrie is like, um, you know, I got a room, so we'll do that. And then. And so we're like, okay, cool. We're roommates and we train and, you know, we're best buds. And then she hits me up. She's like, you know, there's a Paragon here. I was like, excuse me? And so that next weekend we were going almost every weekend to visit those guys, Mm. you know, and it was just, uh, it was when I was really sad, it was a little breath of home. Yeah. Even though I didn't know any of those Paragon guys. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. It just, it felt good to be there. Yeah. Yeah. It's like when you visit a, um, like, or at least when I visit an area school somewhere else, I don't know. I just feel comfortable. Yeah. You know, it's just. I don't know. Is this home? That's, exactly. that's pretty cool. And that's, that's kind of what I try to provide to people regardless of where they're, where they train, you know, I don't care, but you know, I, I try to provide that little, that little piece of home, like make yourself at home. Do you need water? That kind of thing. You know, there's a the bathroom, that kind of shit, but no, it's yeah. absolutely. It felt like a little bit of home and, and I won't be, I won't lie. I was, I was pretty sad yeah. at that time in my life. You know, I was had nothing, you know, I'd left and decided to make my life better, but you know, sometimes you got to break everything to build everything back up. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And that's where I was. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I've been through it. It's rough. It's rough, dude, but I've never been happier. 
So that's cool. (laughs) Same. Crazy, huh? Yeah. Wild, right? Arizona. Yeah. 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 I I actually, I love it out here. Um, This is where, you know, you're, you're, you're in a perfect situation, um, Colin, because this is where Midwesterners come to die. (laughs) <laughs> that's that's true. You don't have to retire and go anywhere. You can stay right here. Uh, yesterday, I was having dinner with my parents for New Year's Eve, and they they kicked me out, and they were a little bit upset because they missed the Midwest, uh, the beginning of the Midwest New Year's Eve party at in Sun City. They missed the brat dinner. <laughs> Oh, that sounds good. <laughs> yeah, I know, yeah. It sounds amazing, actually. I'm like, oh, is it everyone from Wisconsin? I'm like, no, we invited some people from Iowa, and we invited some people from Minnesota. But oh, yeah, that's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. They have, the, they have their Midwest community out there in, in Sun City, but that was the jo- that's what I was told when I moved out here. No one is from Arizona. No, it's usually well, the first the, the first very question few. is where are you from? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And you're expecting like a different state. Yeah. Very rarely do you hear, oh, I'm from here. Yeah. Yeah, Amy. Over. Amy was born and, and raised here, mm-hmm. but her parents are from like Indiana or something. Well, her mom's from Coolidge, so she's from here. I mean, sorta. I don't know. You ever <laughs> been to Coolidge? No. Not cool. No. Not great. It's not cool. It's not great. <laughs> no. 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 Um, Unless you point on a map, I don't know where it is. No, you. It, there's no need. There's no need. Don't go there. It's okay. Um, there was one restaurant. I think they owned it. Amy's <laughs> family owned it, and then it's, it's gone now. I think. But um, but yeah. So. Um, so how did you end up with um, at, at, at w- with Paul? I mean, we're teammates now, right? So tell me about that. I, I know it's kind of a zigzaggy kind of, well, not really. I mean, it's I mean, circuitous, not, not but so not, much. not too it's, bad. Well, I got out here and um, I, I just, you know, was staying with a friend and, you know, I was like, man, I need to train, you know, that's of, of all of us, you know, in this room, we all understand that. And so um, I, my friend who was, you know, begging me like, come on, I found a place for you. And I was like, okay. So it seemed like a good thing. And it was Maricaba. It was Andre and Sarah. No kidding. And so I went there and they were awesome to me. Yeah. I was only there for a couple of months um, because I moved in with Carrie and then, you know, she was training with Carlos and it just made sense, you know, to, to switch over, you know, cause yep. it was far from where we were Maricaba, but they were awesome to me. They, uh, I competed for them once and I uh, did okay. I think I went one and one and I have nothing but great things to say about Andre and, and his wife. They were so awesome. But then we went over to Carlos's and Carlos again was, was amazing to me. Really showed me the big man stuff, you know, yeah. like how to, how to be heavy, yeah. how to be heavy for a 150 pound guy or 145 pound guy. That's, that's key. When somebody, you get off of somebody when training and they're like, dude, man, you feel like you're 300 pounds. I'm like, I know. <laughs> I know. And it's, yeah. um, you know, so then I just, um, Things were at a crossroads again, you know, and um, just, you know, things happen at gym, stuff like that. I wasn't getting along with a certain person there, you know, no big deal. It wasn't Carlos. It was just another guy. Mm-hmm. And um, vibe wasn't for me anymore. You know, I'm a California guy. Paul and I are literally from like the same town almost. Yeah. And I remember doing a seminar, a little seminar over there. Just my friend Igor and I went over there and we taught this one thing over at Paul's gym. And I looked around and I'm like, huh, wow, all these dudes are my size. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And you know, I wasn't going to jump ship or anything like that, but when the situation arose that it was time for me to leave, you know, the place I was at, the first place I went to was Paul's and I said, okay, let's have the awkward conversation. Cause yeah. I'm you know, so many striped brown belt, you know, yeah. I hate to have this conversation, but you know, he was so nice, so kind. He let me tackle that really awkward conversation, like such an amazing man. And made me feel so welcomed the very first moment I was there. Yeah. So He's got a way to do that, man. Yeah, that's that that's a hard conversation to have. That California yeah, that was that was a definite hard conversation because yeah. I just literally and I quote, I'm all right. Awkward conversation time. <laughs> when am I getting my black belt? You yeah. know, and it was it was kinda like that because, you know, we're just two older men and he understood what the situation was and it was no disrespect on his part because I love the man dearly. Yeah. And yeah. you know, he tackled it like oh, and I was like, Oh my god, he made that so easy. Yeah. Cause I was dreading that. I, yeah. I was totally dreading that. Of course. So, yeah. You know, and been happy ever <laughs> since. That's good, man. That's good. What what do you think is um I mean, I know because I grew up there, right? But what do you think is the um, the thing that the the special sauce, the magic that is, uh, you know, Aries, Arizona, Paul Nava's place? That could be a long answer, but I mean, I'll, I'll try. And we got time. It. Yeah, it's. Um, Carrie, you good on that chair? <laughs> All right, we got time. It's you know, so the first time I walked in there as as even a, a whatever striped brown belt, right? You know, you're, you're a little intimidated, mm-hmm. and you haven't been there. You know, coming from a different school. Um, you know, you're, you know, it's all tattered and everybody looks at it and, 
you're just like, okay, are they going to beat the crap out of me here? You know, I'm not all that big. I don't have size, you know, to kind of defend myself. That's a real thing for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I go into a place and, you know, a bigger guy, if he really wants to beat the shit out of me, he can, Mm -hmm. you know, I can only defend myself so much, you know, until we stand up and I start kicking and punching and then I'm doing okay (laughs) because I do that well. But, um, you know, it's just, uh, Paul's vibe. And really once I figured out Paul was from San Jose, it changed everything for me. Mm. Like I really figured, I was like, okay, we both went to high school, you know, not too far away from one another. You know, he made a comment about, um, a bar from Santa Cruz where I was born by the way. Um, and it's this little dive bar called, you know, called the catalyst. And I remember my sister and my mom always telling stories about that. And he mentioned it the other night and I'm all, I bet you my mom's probably da 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 or whatever. <laughs> we both look at each other and just, there was a moment of silence. And then we had this connection. We laughed our, off right? that's funny and you know just because we know and like the vibe was just what i needed um it was the california vibe you know i went yeah. in there and no disrespect to anybody else but i heard like metallica and things like that and you know i, I love the the brazilian music but you know so much is so much yeah right? i hear you so. yeah you know i was talking to somebody today at the at the open mat that's going to leave their academy and go to a different academy i won't say who or which which academy and i i tell them the same thing that Paul told me years ago, because I would see people come and go. I'm like, why or why, why? Um, you know what I mean? Like, I love it there. Like I, I never even, I never considered leaving Paul's place ever. Like for, it just never, I don't, I couldn't, I couldn't fathom, but, um, you know, white belt to black belt at one Academy. I was the second one with Paul to go from white belt to black belt. I wish, I wish, uh, what's his name? Uh, could, uh, Jeremiah would take him would have taken more time off. I would have beat him to the black belt. But anyway, <laughs> um, but you know, he he just put it so perfectly. He says, you know, if they quit, then we failed them. Right? If they don't train, we failed them. But if they leave and go train somewhere else, their needs just changed. That's it. They have different needs now. Like I said this on the last on a podcast before. I was like, I didn't know that I needed that community. I didn't know that I needed Paul in my life. I didn't know that I needed these these people until I went there and realized I, I needed this. Right. And sometimes your needs change. Like, you know, you're looking for people your size or you're looking for some place that's, you know, that's more focused on competition, less, less about community, more about you. Cool. Right. If you find it, go, go get it. I mean, yes, it hurts the, the Academy owner. I mean, yeah. financially, and it hurts that it hurts them personally because they invest time in their students. I know I invest a lot into mine, but some people come and go. And the, the only ones that really hurt me are the ones that quit because I feel like I failed them, you know? So needs just change, man. I mean, it's just one of those things. I absolutely agree. It happened when I was with the San Luis Obispo Paragon and, um, Santa Maria Paragon's not very far. It's just, uh, it's South about 20 minutes. And those dudes are gangsters. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not joking. Like, I mean, the gnarliest gangster music you've ever heard during the kids class. And you didn't say anything on the side. You know, if you weren't, if you weren't a coach or whatever, same thing that we have, but you know, I'm just very enforced. And I knew that when it was coming time for competition, I had to go there. I had to go to Santa Maria because San Luis was, you know, close to the college and, you know, so it was a little, a little softer. I'll just be honest. It was a little yeah. softer in Santa Maria. These guys were gnarly and they beat the crap out of me. I got my arm busted in a tournament. I mean, this far the other way Ugh. and they all thought I'd quit and I didn't. I came back and won the U S open four weeks later, but I came back into their gym two weeks later. Lance, uh, Lance Glenn looked at me and he's just like, okay, okay. And then Manny, another, uh, another gentleman that was one of Lance's black belts and Frangina's black belts, he pulls me aside a couple years later. He's all, we all thought you were going to quit. He's like, you got that thing broken. Like we never seen. And just, man, that was, that was gnarly. I have a, I have the video. I'll send it to you sometime. It's <laughs> Love awesome. to see it. It's awesome. You know, Love you to see, see my it. Whole arm just hyper extended. It's great. Um, it was a very different time though. Yeah. It's, it was, it was so much different. It was so much more like war, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, just, you know, they didn't care. You just roll you off the mat next match. Come on. You know, I mean, yeah. literally, <clears throat> literally. So, you know, I just felt like my needs had changed. It really did have changed. Mm-hmm. So you're absolutely spot on. Yeah. yeah. I think there too, there's, there's a lot of pressure changing gyms on yourself. Like when you're going, uh, especially as an upper belt, like coming, coming to Paul's as a brown belt. I came, I came to Aries as a one stripe purple belt. Purple. Yeah. And, um, there was a lot of pressure, I think not just on me to prove that I am a purple belt, but I'm also representing 
Reds gym. I'm representing Milwaukee or, you know, even Wisconsin jiu-jitsu. All those that came before, man. And I'm just like, yeah. and, and, and someone reached out to me after I started training and, you know, I was you know, posting about it. And they said, did you, did you wear your purple belt right away? And I said, I, I thought about it. Yeah. I thought about just saying, let's just start from scratch. Because I didn't, I had, I had taken three years off. Just That's to, tough, dude. Coming uh, back as a purple belt after three years yeah. off. Yeah. Ooh. And I, and I, and I just, my neck hurts just thinking about that. It was so, and it was so bad because I was smoked by white belts. I, uh, Dallas kept on triangling me and I'm just like, okay, this is, I'm, I'm better than this. And I'm like, I'm going to go to a nogi class yeah. and I'm going to show him cause I, I was more of a nogi guy. And I said, I'm just going to, I'm going to look at the toughest guy. I'm just going to just head, put, him. just, just, just head, him. just dominate and just show him why I am a purple belt. Um, Keola. That's what. Oh <laughs> yeah. It, it, it didn't work out in my no, favor. That's but, not going to work. But no, I no. I, I, I said like a, a friend reached out. He's like, it's and I said it. It really is hard coming in uh, to a new gym, even, new school, even in the same city. I, I I can see the pressure is not just on you. Mm. It's, it's 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 or not for you. It's 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 for everyone that that's trained you and and trained with. It's yeah. Scary. It, 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 I'll be honest. It's it was kind of scary. You know, you're just like, you know, you're kind of the enemy walking in, in a sense, it, yeah. you know, at least in my mind, that's what I, you know, of course it wasn't that way. And I'm, you know, I live and die for my team. So, yeah. Well, Paul, Paul's got a way of making it a little tough on you when you walk in, when you walk into that Academy and you probably experienced this because he used to use me as like one of the, you know, one of the pawns. And so new guy would come in, checking us out. Maybe he was a blue belt, purple belt, whatever. And Paul would be like, Hey, what with him next? And then he'd kind of walk over and to somebody else, hey, roll with him after Alex goes. And, you know, and then he put like the tough guy, toughest yeah. guys on the, on the mat with just to see how, he, how he'd hold up. And I, I've never been the type, like if I go visit a school, like out of state, if I get my ass handed to me or if I, you know, dominate, quote unquote, but I never come back and, oh man, they suck. They, you know, I kicked everybody's ass. I'm, I had a great time. That's it. That's all I ever say. Oh my God, it was so much fun. Because it's not about, you know, dominating anybody, right? So whenever, you know, he would have me roll with somebody, I'd, I'd roll hard, you know, but I, I'd go back to Paul and I'd be like, hey, he's got a good this, he's got a good that. It was never like I did this or that to him. I was always, I always find like, I try to find like the compliment that he brings to our team and Paul could, Paul could see like, oh, maybe he's got a great stand up, right? Maybe he needs some work on his guard retention, but he's got a great guard pass, you know, that type of thing. So I always focus on that type of stuff. And that's just the outlook of being what looking at the situation in more of a positive manner, I suppose. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, it's all your, all your mindset. You know, I, I talk to a lot of people, you know, throughout work and this, that, and the other. And, and the first thing that comes out of people's mouth sometimes is just such a negative connotation, mm. whatever it is, you know, but I think what brought me off of the, off of your statement from that was you know, you looked at the situation and the fact that they have great stand up or this guy is, you know, really good at an ankle pick or whatever it mm -hmm. is. You know, I like that a lot because what can they add to us? What can I learn from them? You know, look at what I learned from this guy. I mean, just by watching him, you know, or rolling with them and try to add that. It's yeah, it's it's amazing. Yeah. You, you can't be this pretty, though. I'm sorry. You can't <laughs> well, teach that. I get it. I get yeah, it. All. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there was a guy that came in. He was only on our team for like a year. His name's Blaze, Blaze Chatham. We were both white belts at the time. And Blaze was from the East Coast out here for, he was a, I think he was out of school, but he was That's like cool a. Cool name. Oh yeah, yeah, Blaze, right? And, and he was, was he an a, American gladiator? He was a D2 wrestler. <laughs> okay. So, so yeah. <laughs> so when, when That's he. That's even, yeah, even scarier. Worse, yeah. <laughs> but he's a short dude. And, you know, he and I would battle. We'd go back and forth. But the one thing that he taught me is how to drill. So I'd never trained with a wrestler before and he trained everything like a wrestler. So if Paul would set a timer and said, you know, we were going to do this drill for X amount of minutes, blaze wouldn't look up. You know how when people are like drilling something and they do it twice and then they sit and they're talking, yeah. you know what I mean? Blaze taught me like you put your head down and you drill it and you drill it and you drill it and you drill it and you, drill it and you don't look up until somebody tells you to stop. And that's, that was huge for me. And those are the types of things like he came from somewhere else, but I wasn't judgmental like, oh, he sucks at this or he sucks at that or he's too, you know, he's really good at whatever. Um, like he taught me how to drill. There was a I, I, I was training in Chicago two years ago and there was a, an, another I, I wish I remember his name, but he had won one of the ultimate fighters. 
And I didn't know who he was at the time, but I knew he was going to be good because he had the tattoo of the logo of his shirt and pants on his arm. So I'm like, he's either oh, rich. shit. <laughs> <laughs> and I found out, yeah, yeah, he was, he was a veteran and, and it's, a, it's like a, it's a veteran based uh, jujitsu company for equipment. But, uh, he and I partnered up for the training and it was, it was, it was something really simple, something we've all done. It was, it was, um, it was an ankle pick to side control, side control to Americana, Americana to wrist lock. Done. Very, like, you don't know what we're doing, but you can picture doing it in your head. Yeah, absolutely. And he said, I'm going to do this 20 times. I'm going to go really slow the first time and I'm just going to speed up. And so that's how he trained. Like yeah. even a, a move, he was a black belt. <clears throat> yeah. He could, he could do everything. But no, he's he's going to get this fluid moment or a movement starting from going really, really slow, very just getting that mu- muscle memory. Yep. And then by the 20th time, it was just like second nature yeah. already. Beautiful. Yeah. That's I, lo- what I, I love do. that. Yeah. yeah, I love that. It's it's just a flow drill. Mm-hmm. But but once once you get into that flow and someone doesn't know you're doing it, you can execute all the way to the end. It's it's wild, dude. It's wild. I love that. Yeah. That's and I, I'll even if I if and when I'm when I'm teaching in my class we do a lot of like the uh, passing drills or attacking drills like that where we just do swinging arm bars. Yeah. If I see sloppy arm bars, I'll say, I'll just stop. Yeah. We're, I'm like we're not doing it as fast as we can now. We're resetting to full guard every single time just to get because I I don't want you to just do it quick. I want you to do it right. Yeah. Yeah. When uh, when Van Buren was teaching at Paul's, and I'm sure he still does it today. He, he would say, he, he would, what would he call it? He would call it, um, I think he called it something like an empty rep. So no empty reps, like no s- sloppy, right? So if we're going to do like, you know, ankle pick to, you know, to side control or whatever, he wanted, he wanted the person on bottom to move as well. So yeah. it wasn't like, you know, when we were doing like takedown drills, especially it's like take down hold for three seconds, but bottom person, you're trying to stand up. Mm-hmm. So there was nothing empty and they sucked. That, you know, that takes a lot of effort, yeah. <laughs> you know, and you're just like warming up to, you know, we would, we would warm up and then we would do like drills and then technique. And he was always really like, the technique was always like really upbeat. And then you're thinking, man, we still have to fucking roll after this. <laughs> <laughs> but, but again, those people that teach you how to, how to do it right, because you know, you could, you could go through the motions all you want, but it's not going to feel the same when you're, when you're going you know, against a uh, resisting opponent. Right. So, yeah. yeah. So anyway, so, um, so let, let's talk about like, uh, competition, stuff like that. What, what was your, you know, going into or coming here, right. Uh, did you do a lot of local tournaments? I don't remember seeing you do a lot of local stuff. It was interesting. Um, I think, uh, I did as many as I could when I was a white and blue belt, of course. Right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, that's typically kind of the, what we usually do. Yeah. Um, at purple belt, I, um, I, I I'll be honest. I did a first couple of competitions and I got blown away mm. and I didn't win for a whole year. So I started slowing it down and then I finally did start winning at purple belt and I started doing well. And then, um, I just, when I came out here, I think I did two competitions. Um, I did the first one. It was this, it was the master cup. I still have the shirt. You can't read it. It was the ugliest shirt I've ever seen. <laughs> it's like, is that even a shirt? They're like the, the, the color and the font. Was it the and, yellow one? It, no, it was the dark blue one with the black writing. Oh, yeah, yeah, And it was yeah, just, yeah. I was like, that thing's so ugly. But I remember, I just remember because of that <laughs> shirt. I remember that that one we did. And um, I did a couple more, um, but I felt like, to almost even circle back, I felt like um, more was not the quality way to go. I felt like really honing my skills and preparing for each competition um to, I, I feel like I only have so much time left. Sure. I, my yeah. body, my body is not going to hold up forever. You know, I'm 46 years old, yeah. 46, 47. I don't know, whatever. <laughs> um, but I felt like it was more important to focus on drilling, mm-hmm. being perfect, being right and correct. And not so much choosing the right opponents, but when I do get out there, I'm as ready as I possibly can. Um, ready to fight the best I can, you know? And like I said, I will fight anybody, but mm-hmm. at the same time, I want to be as ready as I possibly can. So I started doing bigger i felt bigger matches and less does that make sense yeah you saw me on the fight to wins and yeah stuff. And absolutely so, yeah you know like a, a fight to win to me the preparation you know everybody's like oh it's one match i'm like um for me personally it's like three tournaments in one and, and yeah. one match because the mental preparation the walkout this that the other it is just different for me so yeah and and you nailed the last one you nailed the walkout 
<laughs> yeah, I sure got smoked in the match. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't, I wasn't going to bring that up. That's you... not the point, Danny. I know, I know. Oh, my gosh. We yeah. had a good time together, though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we both we both have uh, an affinity for professional wrestling, so we both had professional wrestling walkouts. Walkouts? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah. I'm I'm sorry, but uh, John Cabay's Santa Claus one, that one's going to be hard to beat, dude. He, he was throwing candy out, had the big beard going, had the Santa hat going on. It's a couple of years ago. Well, uh, I came out to... Uh, this this guy Bobby Roode and his Nick in in wrestling he was the glorious one. Ah, okay. So that's his whole theme song. It's just glorious. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty epic actually. And you know, <laughs> again, we're not going to talk about the match. The match didn't go a, 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 as well as expected. We're talking about walkouts. Yeah, our walkouts. Uh, were we the won best. the walkout. Yeah, yeah, we won. No, even my friends were like, "Dude, you had the best walkout." I'm like, you know what? <laughs> that makes me feel I'll better. Take but yeah, smoked. Seth talked to me afterwards. He's like, "That was awesome." <laughs> I'm like, "Well, thank you, thank you, thank you." But I, I wish I had. You know, it'd be nice to have a little pyro, maybe. Yeah. Little, uh, oh, for sure. Rope. I didn't know. You know, if yeah. I mean, Kabe could pull off Santa Claus. He really can. Well. I have yeah. a plan for the next one. I just know that if the production value for the fight to wins goes back to where it was. Um, when we were first starting to do it, you know, yeah. the, the whole, um, you know, I have a little plan and I know Seth is such a good guy that, you know, he's let me play my own music when he won't let anybody else play their own music. Cause you know, he's like, well, usually I get these songs that are like a Casio keyboard song. Uh, and so yeah. he listened to the actual music that I'd produced. He's like, whoa, whoa. And his wife is a DJ or an ex DJ oh, okay. and she listened to it and she's like, no, let the, let them fucking play their music. Oh, that's and cool. So I feel like Seth's a really, um, pliable guy if i have a really good idea and i have a couple ideas for entrances and just you know star wars theme this that the other ah, it, nice. set yourself yes. apart from everybody else right? yeah yeah you know what maybe i don't go out there and win but you had a really good time watching me and you know what? that's cool maybe you'll come train with us yeah yeah um <clears throat> i really hope number one we don't have rails on the freaking sides that was that that's was horrible huh? insane dude like whoever Okay, so I'm sure it was like a fire safety or something like some kind of athlete safety that the venue um, asked for. We should never do that venue again. Mm-hmm. They should never get another anything. They're, they're, they're too stupid to walk the earth, in my opinion. There are f- people physically lifting each other and slamming each other on the, on the mats. You don't think these rails might come into play, you morons? We there watch, like, there we watch wrestling. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, you should have come off the top rope or the top rail, whatever. But I'm just saying. Yeah. I'm just saying. Oh, oh. I would have made it. Could have gone match. all in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but I mean, that is the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my life. No, there was a couple of matches where it came close. I'm sure. I'm sure. Like, have you ever I, seen Million Dollar Baby? I'm just saying. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying. I mean, someone could have gotten seriously hurt because of their rules and, and safety. That's just stupid. Again, I'm waiting for, you know, like we've seen a couple of posts here and there that the production's going to go back to where it was. Good. So that's, you know, I mean, uh, I, I like I said, I'm getting older, you know, and I want one, a nice, big, fat, juicy pay-per-view win for my last one where yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. hang it up, hang it up just for the pay-per-view fights. <laughs> but I mean, afterwards, Kabe looked at me and he's just like, that wasn't the last one. He's all, he looked around, he's all. It, it, he almost gave me the look as if he's like, I'm not letting that one going to be the last one for you. Yeah. Win, lose, or draw. I want to go out on a, you know, a nice production. You know, this just, it just wasn't the same. Yeah. Last yeah. one. And I, I believe in Seth. I believe in him. I do too. I mean, he, he. Been great to me. Hope, I, I'm glad, I'm glad he's taking a step back from the ADCC. I think it, it did a lot of a harm to him. I mean, from his post that he posted, it yeah. took a lot out of him. And I hope this, uh, the smaller, um, I hate to call it smaller because it's not that small, but. I think him having more control over the fight to wins and, and giving us more time than a week, you know, to put everything together because I mean, we love to sell tickets, right? I mean, mm-hmm. that's kind of fun. You know, you get your friends there table, stuff like that. But when you ask them to do it sh- that short notice, it, it's tough. And when you're not pe- even sure that you're going to fight until a couple of days before. Right. And you're mentally like that part, part of it's right there. You're mentally preparing for, to go show the world what you can do. And thusly, you're not informed until two days later. And then mm-hmm. you got to get a, you know, a, a table of people going, you know, yeah. it's, it's a little bit, you know, the first couple that we did, there was a long build up. There was a photo shoot. Yeah. For that, for it was everything. fun. It was yeah. really fun. It was a great experience. Yeah. And, you know, some of my favorite times, you know, you'd couple. go to like MMA lab and do the weigh ins. Yeah, and- it was, it was a production. You felt yeah. like. You know, it felt like something like this was a big deal, Yeah. you know, and, and all the work that I had put in and all the, the pain and tears, this, that, and the other, it was worth it. Mm. You know, it really was. So. Yeah. Well, I got my ass handed to me <laughs> in, uh, one of them, but in my first one, but that was fun. Yeah. That was, yeah. Still, yeah. 
You know, yeah. they'll get back. I really feel like he'll get back there and we'll be back to that level. And then, you know, the three of us, I'm sure will be on a fight card again soon. Yeah, that'd be yeah. that'd be a lot of fun. We should fight each other. We should do like a like a like all a at round once. Round. Yeah. Yeah. Three, uh, yeah. Yeah. I fight all dirty when it comes like that. <laughs> <laughs> or like yeah. a like a Royal Rumble. Like you just push them off the stage. OK. Didn't they do that? Wasn't there like a, a, a promotion that did that with kids? <laughs> I they did. Know. I think they did that with kids. I don't know, but I sadly kind of want to watch. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I always wondered about that. I, I was, I, I don't like watching the kids' matches. I, I think it's too much to have kids up there with the rule set, and I don't know, man. I'm, I don't, I don't like it. But if, if, if the parents are, you know, okay with it, I don't, I don't, whatever. But okay, so my big question is: Remember back when they were paying people to win? They were, they were like, I don't know if they still do that. They, I, I don't know, but I, I didn't get paid. I, did I get paid? Maybe I did. Anyway, but they were paying like 250 bucks for the winner, and then they had the the sub of the night, stuff like that. As soon as you get paid, aren't you aren't you a professional? Yeah. Okay, so what happens if a kid does a pro fight and then ends up going to a college? I mean, won't that disqualify them as a, as as an amateur? Uh, I think it's it's got to be specific to the sport. Okay, so if they did jujitsu and maybe they do wrestling, it's two different things. So you're okay. Yeah. Okay. Because okay. I know um, there was a guy who a, a basketball player. Yeah. Who's won NBA champ? Like he was on the team with like LeBron when they won in Cleveland. He went back to college. He had a year of eligibility left, and he was on the golf team. Okay. Okay. So I think so, I think it is like specific to your sport. So okay, so it has to be okay. That 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 makes me feel better. But I still don't like seeing the kids up there. I I don't know, man. It's just too much. It's too much. I, I had know. some friends from back home. It's a lot of. St- it's a big stress. It is. Thing. It's yeah. a lot of stress, man. And yeah, it's you know <clears throat> they're watching it on pay per view back in Wisconsin, and they said and they turn it on and it's kids fighting. Yeah, they're like, what are, what are we watching? That? Yeah, I don't want to see that. It's a little weird. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man. But um, anyway, so um, what what's coming up for you uh, at twenty four? What's your what what are the goals for twenty four? <clears throat> I I usually stay pretty quiet about my goals just because. Um, Oh, share it, you big sissy. No, we no, got 12 I, listeners. No, no, yeah. no, There's not. more people in the room now <laughs> than are going to listen to this show. So um, I, it's just, it's a weird, it's a weird um, mentality thing for me. I try not to put the energy out of like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get this right, done. Right. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they're like, oh, I thought you're going back to typing class and here you are <laughs> not in typing class. Right. Um, so 28 I usually, words a minute, baby. Yeah, 20. Wow. That's pretty good. <laughs> um, two fingers. Two fingers. You do have two fingers, don't you? I'm not the best typer, but I mean, even though I type for my job, but whatever. So no, I, I try to keep things a little bit more close to the chest at the same time. Um, cause I feel the energy. Um, I produce my own energy, my own fire and nothing will burn hotter than, than the, like the push that I give myself. So what do I literally have? Because Alex is asking and I love Alex. Um, I have a couple things to accomplish this year. I have to win a gold medal as a black belt. Okay. Because I have my other four. You know, my other four gold medals is my other belts. Mm-hmm. I have to do that. Um, and like I stated before, I want a big win. I want a big old fat win nice. on pay per view where I may even like go and split a beer with split a beer with that guy. Nice. And I don't drink. So nice. um, all right. Something like that, you know, uh, get out there a little bit more. But um I also want to make sure that um you know, a couple of my really, really good friends, Carrie included, uh, compete this year, and I want to coach them and get them to the next level. I try to really, I'm giving back more than I'm taking now. Good. I really want to do that. I actually do even special, like, impromptu classes on um, 10 a.m. Paul's going to be like, what? No, like 10 a.m., just if, you, if you're like my friend and I invite you, like, we just meet a little bit early before open mat and we drill. And mm. I mean, just drill. Just drill conceptually. What are you good at? Okay, that's what you're going to drill. All right. You want help with that? Eh. But no, it's, I really want to give back and I want to help more people and I want them to get to their goals because I feel like this sport has given me so much as far as just clarity of life and just to look around and see how beautiful everything is, you know, to stop and not just be working all the time and this, that, and the other, what everybody gets bogged down with. Um, you know, there's a lot of goals, but I really want to help my friends. Nice, man. That's it. I love it. I love it. Well, um, two things I ask people, uh, black belts before I close out the show is um, number one is um, your, your, your uh, legacy. How do you want to be remembered? I've actually thought a lot about that lately. There's been a, a realization for me personally that there are probably fewer days ahead than there are behind. Mm-hmm. And that's okay. You know, I mean, um, you know, being 46 or 47, <laughs> somebody help me with the math, but um, 
I, I just, I really, I don't care. You know, yeah. I'm like, whatever, yeah. I'll hit 50 or blah, blah. <clears throat> um, the fact that I'm still alive, thank you, Carrie. Uh, the fact that I'm still alive and doing this is just stellar. Um, and what do I want from uh, the black belt? See, I thought about your question. I really did. And I, I didn't have a big answer. I was thinking about it on the way over here. I didn't have an answer. I think it just. That's okay. I think just to be a good person. Okay. I mean, the skill, we all know the skill level's got to be there, right? You know, what would I, if I belt somebody, you know, they've got to be a certain skill level. But I also want them to just have this certain type of integrity to want to, at some point, give all of it back, pass on what I've learned. You know, I don't have kids, so I want to pass it on to my friends. I want to pass it on to my friends that are my family, you know, even little things here and there, you know, just, I mean, Jiu Jitsu's done so much for me. Yeah. You know, I, I, I can't even uh, I can't even begin to tell you what it's done and where I would probably be if it wasn't for this sport. So I think just just be a good person, right on, man. And have that skill set. Sure, I love of it. course, of course. Yeah, you <laughs> want the skill set. Yeah, don't get your ass kicked. You know, uh, Chris Chris Howder um, said something in a in a video not too long ago, and it really struck me because like when when you're when you're looking at like oh shit, I might get a black belt like within the next couple of years, you know. Holy crap, you know, and then and then you get it and then you're thinking, holy shit, I might be in a position to promote black belts within the next couple of years, you know, like, holy shit. Right. Well, he said something <clears throat> that was like um, he was talking about this brown belt and he said something that was so cool. I, I don't know why I love this so much, but he says uh, he says he, it, it's not one of my brown. You know how he kind of he kind of gets excited when he's talking. It's not one of my brown. It's a it's it's one of my grand brown belts. And I'm like, I oh, want wow. a grand brown belt. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds freaking cool, right? Yeah. Like he called him a grand brown belt. It's like, yeah, when you promote and they promote, they're your grand brown belt. <laughs> whatever whatever wow. belt that is. That's kind of neat, man. Well, that's a cool, yeah, I like that. Right? It's, Isn't that sweet? <laughs> yeah, because you're, you're, honestly, Alex, your question's been boggling me since we spoke the other day. Really? Uh, yeah, I was like, what's the <clears throat> format? Yada, yada, all that stuff. But you hit me with that question, and I think... The answer is I'm not ready to promote anybody to a black belt. So I didn't have an answer for you. <laughs> yeah. I don't feel that I'm at that level yet. I feel like I need to learn more. I need to be able to give back to my friends. I need to learn from you guys. I mean, you two teach me a lot and I feel like I know nothing compared to both of you. I really feel like that. Yeah. And so I feel like I've got a long way to go before I can actually really give you a full answer. But, you know, sorry, I just had to. All good, man. Off my head right there. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good answer, though. I like that. And uh, what about you? What do you want? What do you, what do you have going on for 24? Uh, well, teaching, teaching Monday through Friday. That's right. Damn it. 1135. 1130 ish. No, uh, well, I, I, I again, I, I don't think I'm, I'm not competing as much anymore. I, I like to do the one-offs. I like to do the, the, the super fights. Mm -hmm. Um, I wouldn't mind doing some low cause I'm, I really want to get more of my students to compete mm -hmm. and I, you know, I want to be, you know, the, the example, right? Yeah. yeah the, lead, gen, the general in the field. Yeah. Not, lead not, from the front. Yeah. Um, and so I like to do a couple, a couple tournaments. Uh, and then I'm inching my way towards black belt. Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. Soon. Good. I look at you and I say it and like, I'm like, You're not a black belt. Nope. It's just, I see the skill level and the, the aura, the presence. And, you know, the black belt isn't just necessarily a belt that they give you, but it, like I said, the integrity of the person, I guess we're coming back again full circle. <clears throat> I look at this gentleman right here, you know, a good friend of mine, and I'm just like, you're not a brown belt. Like, I'm most <laughs> offended. Like, you're about, you're, yeah. his, he's black belt level, mentality, skill level. I mean, this guy kicks the crap out of me. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know. I do. I, I do one of the things I appreciate as, as more of a coach now is when I get compliments from my students. Or about my students. Oh, for sure. That's the best. That's I, the best compliment I, ever. Um, promoted uh, someone to blue belt this last promotion this last fall, and I think Tojo and Vin rolled with her. They're like she's good. Oh yeah. And no, she like, attacks. And I'm just like I, I, that was like one of the most prideful things I've had in in jujitsu was yeah. And I, I guess I, I had something to do with it, but I mean it's like it Absolutely. wasn't. It was it was just it wasn't my accomplishment. It was. It was, it's really hers it, it, in a it, sense, it, you know? It, yeah. In a sense it is, but I mean, it's still, it's still a great compliment. It is. You can ride it's, the coattail of that compliment. It was, it was so <laughs> nice. Yeah. I mean, like, um, 
you know, I'll have Paul text me sometimes and be like, hey, one of your blue belts was here and he did this and he did that. That's really good. And that's my head just explodes. You know what I mean? It's just overwhelming because to have, you know, someone that I admire as, as I, as much as I admire Paul, you know, take the time to text me and talk about, you know, one of, one of my students or, you know, one of our students made an impression on him. Yes. And that's uh that's, that's a real big deal. That's a real yeah. big deal for me. So I, I'm, I'm very proud of that. So, but, uh, well, listen, man, we've been going for about an hour and, uh, I'm exhausted. I'm sorry. Yeah. I don't have it in me. No, just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, um, I, I, you know, I wanted everybody to get to know you a little bit better and, and, and I mm-hmm. learned a lot from you. I mean, you know, just not just the podcast day to day, just talking to you and training with you. So I, I wanted everybody to, um, to get an opportunity to, to meet you, you know what I mean? All my 12 listeners. But, uh, and you know, we're trying to close the gap on Tojo. So I'm having Colin on the yeah. show as my uh, co-host. Every I just assumed he would be here. I, I, I owe money. So I thought I was going to reimburse <laughs> him, but he's not here today. Now, see, we're forming a new tag team here. So the next yeah. time he's on, I got to be on. Let's Vice do it. Vice versa. Let's do it. Dan- so. Danny and the goon. Yeah. Danny and it the goon. Sounds a little bit better. Ooh, that yeah. sounds way better than yeah. Tojo and the goon. You know, the, the whole thing is. I would love to, cause you know, we want to get a Patreon thing going and stuff like that. So I would love to have like Danny and the goon or Tojo and the goon. <laughs> I just don't trust you to show up. <laughs> Me? Particular? You, you, I've got you. too many kids. Yes. You have a lot of, you have a lot of responsibilities. And this is like, I'm, I can make it work. This could be like a Legion of Doom back in the day thing where like Paul Ellering took care of Legion of Doom. I yeah. could be like the guy that like, like, dude, get up. We got to go. Come on, come on, come on, come <laughs> yeah. on, come on. The I'm show, picking you up. So here's, here's, how, here's how I think, this is what I think Colin's life is like. You ever been too busy to get gas? Yeah. I think that's his entire <laughs> that's- life. That's what Colin's entire life is. That's, he's got wrong. like five kids, six kids. He's got two, he's got a coyote. You have a coyote? He owns a coyote, dude. Tell him. A dog Odie. <laughs> it's a coyote. We uh, we None rescued we me. we rescued a dog from New Mexico and off the res off the res yeah and um, we were told she was a German Shepherd Australian Shepherd mix and it's an Australian Shepherd coyote mix, but feral. <laughs> None more than my kids, you know. Like I trust Vivian more than I trust any of my kids. Tell her, tell them about the. Um, the your your daughter we'll leave the names out oh Getting my youngest your son to clean yeah. up after her this so, is fantastic so my my youngest daughter is um so i have i have three daughters and uh and a son my youngest daughter is 5 years old and my son's 7 and they were playing and and my my youngest brought brought down all her stuffed animals threw them all over <laughs> and so we just said Tobin, can you can you pick up, put everything, just put everything in this box and bring it upstairs. And, and what she does, and this is scares the hell out of me. <laughs> she said, Finn, I bet, I don't think you're strong enough to carry all these animals up. If, yes, I can. Well, let me, like, let's see. <laughs> and, and he picks up all the stuffed animals, puts <coughs> it in the box and picks it up. And he's, well, I, I'm going to your room. And my daughter's behind him, like just cheering, like, <laughs> "Yeah, you are so strong." I just said, "She is an evil genius. She is five years old, and she's an evil genius." Kathleen Kennedy in a small and form. Just, I love it. Yeah, I said, like, if there's an apocalypse and there's, like, she'll survive. Like the the Cormac McCarthy, the road. Like, there's no like food for anyone. She's going to be the person who owns the human meat farm. <laughs> yeah. She won't, she won't harvest the meat. No, she'll, no. she'll enjoy a T bone. Yeah. And she'll, yeah, yeah. she'll get the people there, but she'll, she'll be running it. She's going to be. Run- <laughs> so I'm going to have to call her to get you to get up so I can pick you up for our tag team matches. Yeah. 100%. That, that'll work. That'll 100%. Work. She that. might be driving. Actually, mm-hmm. she might be driving. <laughs> oh my gosh. Beautiful. Well, listen guys, thank you guys for doing this. Um, uh, we have, we'll have to do it again. I don't know. We'll do it after a big tournament or something. Uh, uh, you know, when we're all we're, we're all angry at our students for not doing what we teach them. But uh, or after fight to win, after fight to win, yeah, after fight to win. Yeah, there you go. Or <clears throat> you had a better submission to win against or for. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> nothing, nothing will be being uh, smothered for four minutes by. I have a photo if you want it. I have a photo of him being smothered. <laughs> he was there. Oh I was yeah, there. yeah, yeah. I was. I was hurt. My back was killing because I got body triangled and I had to tap to that. Ouch. Was, yeah. Yeah. Was gonna break. all right well listen everybody um if you love the podcast or if you hate the podcast please like and subscribe and leave us a uh, review um subscribe on on uh spotify and youtube please we are 
what, a hundred, less than a hundred people uh, shy of a thousand subscribers. So that's kind of cool. Um, uh, let's see. What else? Uh, BioPro. Let's uh, thank our sponsor, BioPro. Uh, I've been taking it for about four months now. It's fantastic. I feel like I grew another lung. I don't know if you guys use it, but it's awesome. So you need another lung. Yeah, BioPro. <laughs> it's been helping a lot. So, um, guys, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Yep. All right. See you, everybody. Cheers. This episode of the BJJ Foxcast is brought to you by BioPro. BioPro is an all-natural alternative to prescription human growth hormone, which aids in recovery, anti-aging, metabolism, libido, immunity, skin health, cognition, sleep, and stress. Just one vial per day provides a substantial boost to all of these growth factors. Okay, so that's what they want me to say. Here's what I know as an aging grappler. I've been using BioPro Plus and the nighttime variant BioPro Plus Cortisleep for several months, and it feels like I've grown a third lung. My, ga my gas tank is noticeably bigger. My recovery is faster, and I'm back on the mats much quicker, not just between training sessions, but between rounds. Now you can get $30 off your first order of BioPro when you use the code FOXCAST at www.bioproteintech.com. That's code FOXCAST for $30 off your first order at www.bioproteintech.com. Thank you, BioPro.